Hey, what's up guys? My name is Nicholas Corsell, and you're watching The Literary Nomad. Earlier this year, I made a personal goal for myself to expand the things that I'm reading and start to really familiarize myself with some Latin American literature. As such, I figured there was no better place to start than the work of Jorge Luis Borges. Today we're going to be looking at one of his more famous short stories, The Garden of Forking Paths. This video is going to be broken up into three parts. The first, we're going to talk about just the plot of the story, so what actually happened. Next, we're going to move on and talk about Borges as an author and understand some additional context that can kind of texturize and add some additional meaning to the plot that we just discussed. And then finally, we're going to analyze the story and really try to uncover what the core ideas that Borges was trying to convey. We're going to be looking beyond the plot and trying to really understand what we can learn and what Borges wanted us to take away from it. So without further ado, let's get right into it. This very short, simple story follows a Chinese man living in England who happens to be a German spy. This Chinese man's name is Yu Sun, and he's being followed by Captain Richard Madden. Madden has no idea that Yu Sun knows the secret that could unlock the entire war. Yu Sun knows where the British are hiding their artillery. So in the simplest terms, the story is just following Yu Sun as he tries to convey the location of this artillery to the German army without being caught by Madden or putting himself into any danger. Another interesting point to keep in mind is that Yuzun is not spying out of this undying love for Germany or a belief in their cause. No, all he wants to do is prove that an Asian man is capable of unlocking the war, that an Asian man can be the turning point. And so Yuzun buys a ticket to this little village called Ashgrove, and he takes the train to get there. He goes past the correct station, so to kind of throw Captain Madden off of his trail, and then he walks it back. Around this point, Madden nearly catches him. As the train is coming out of the station, we see uh, Captain Madden is running after the train, and the train is just pulling away, and so they just miss each other, and Yuzun is off free. Eventually, we end up at this man named Albert's house, and Albert is a sinologist, which is just a guy who really, really likes Chinese culture, and Yuzun knocks on the door, he opens it up, and they get to talking. Albert thinks that Yuzun is there because of his work on Shui Pen, but in reality, Yuzun just wants to use Albert to convey where the uh, the artillery is for the Germans. Regardless, as they get talking, it comes out that Yuzun is actually a descendant of Shui Pen, the guy who Albert has dedicated his life to studying and unlocking the one novel that he wrote. For additional context, in the novel, Shui Pen was a governor of Yunnan province in China who gave away his power to go away and do two things, write a novel and create a labyrinth. And Albert, this guy that... Um, that Yu Zun has gone to see while running away from Captain Madden has dedicated his life to studying both Chinese culture, Chinese language, and specifically the work of Shui Pen and why he chose to leave his governing position to write this novel and build a labyrinth. And so Albert invites Yu Zun into his house and they get to talking and as the conversation goes on, uh, Albert reveals that he has cracked the code of Shui Pen. He's figured out that there actually wasn't two things that he was working on. He wasn't working on a novel and a labyrinth. The novel was the labyrinth the entire time. After Shui Pen was murdered, all they'd found was just countless, countless manuscripts, all these scribbled drafts that were leading in meandering directions, and people thought that it was just the work of a madman. But no, Albert claims that all of these manuscripts were part of one cohesive manuscript. So it wasn't a bunch of drafts. It was just one novel with infinite meanings. And so when in draft one, a character goes left, and in draft two, they go right, that wasn't two drafts trying to decide what the story was. No, it was one draft that was exploring two possibilities simultaneously, exploring the nature of time, and at its core, that's what Shui Pen's work was about. It was the quintessential novel of time. Very confusing, I know, but the more you think about it and once you start to layer on some additional context, it sort of begins to make sense. So now let's move on and talk a little bit about Borges and maybe use some of this information to help color what we just talked about plot-wise. In case you didn't know, one of the calling cards of Borges is that he really loves to, to play with genre. He is not a writer that really can be confined into one thing. You know, like Jack Kerouac is a stream of conscious novelist. No, that's not really how Borges writes at all. Each story is a unique experiment. In many ways, I would argue that he has more in common with like a scientist than a traditional writer, right? Everything he does is just an experiment. He's trying this out. He's saying, okay, what if I add this to this? Or combine elements of this genre with that genre with that genre and then subvert it in some interesting way. One of my favorite examples of Borges doing this is how when he used to work as a translator, sometimes he would translate a story that just didn't exist and would give credit to a writer that he's translating for a short story that just they never actually wrote and he just thought that that would be, I don't know, funny or interesting or artistically subversive. 
I'm not sure why exactly he did it, but some of these actually ended up in anthologies and ended up published. And I think that that's hilarious. And then coincidentally, the same thing happened in reverse. A American writer wrote a poem that got translated into Spanish and accidentally attributed to Borges and became incredibly famous. So I think it's interesting how, uh, how that foil just kind of naturally worked out. But regardless, that really doesn't have anything to do with the story. Just a very interesting little Borges fact that I learned while researching for this, for this video. Another really interesting characteristic of Borges is that he kind of lived in the middle of two literary movements. He wasn't a modernist. And he wasn't a postmodernist, yet he was both, if that makes sense. In the words of legendary author David Foster Wallace, Borges was the great bridge between modernism and postmodernism. And honestly, I know I haven't read an incredible amount of Borges yet, and throughout this year I definitely plan on reading more and familiarizing myself with him. I couldn't think of a more accurate way of, of describing him, right? And typically when David Foster Wallace says something, he's usually right. I mean, he's probably the smartest writer that's ever lived. I don't know if he's the best, but he's definitely among the smartest. Now let's move on to the final section of the video, the analysis. As I mentioned earlier, The Garden of Forking Paths is essentially about time. It's a short story about time describing a novel about time that is really a labyrinth about time. So this idea of time really runs concurrently throughout every aspect of this story. We see Yuzun is running away from Captain Madden, so it's a race against time. He's trying to convey the location of the artillery to the Germans in a specific amount of time. The novel that Shui Pen has written is directly characterizing time. And then this story is a perfect example of the infinite possible worlds theory. And really, to keep things as simple as possible, the infinite possible worlds theory just suggests that every decision we make creates a new world, and every decision that we didn't make is a possible world. So if I go into a house, and hug the person who lives in there, that's one world. There's another world where I kill them. There's another world where they're not home and it's forever and ever and ever. That just continues on every possible decision, right? I go out my house, I turn left, that's a world. I turn right, that's a world. I keep going straight, I go back to my house, I fall and break my leg, I meet my soulmate. All of these are possible worlds. And this theory is used to describe what is called modal logic. And modal logic is just a subversion or maybe a continuation of propositional logic, which is just the logic of statements, so true or false binaries, essentially. And so while propositional logic is just a true or false statement, modal logic adds qualifiers like probably or maybe to them. And many philosophers have suggested that literary texts are a great way of explaining this possible world's modal logic theory. As we read a book, we are creating a possible world in our head, the characters are creating a possible world, and this just compounds and compounds and compounds with every page that we go through in the text. And so this fictional book of labyrinths written by Shui Pen, who is a fictional character in a fictional story by fiction writer Jorge Borges, is just creating just this unbelievably huge amount of possible worlds that like our brains can't even comprehend. And that is really at its core what the story is about. And so part of the fun of, of reading a book that's about possible worlds is exploring them mentally in our heads. And so Shui Pen, at the end of the novel, when Albert turns, he just kind of randomly and disjointedly pulls out a gun and shoots him dead. And it seems jarring, but that is a possible world. There's also a possible world where he doesn't kill Albert. There's a possible world where he decides, you know what, I'm not going to kill Albert. I'm not going to give him away to the Germans because he kills Albert because his name is Albert and that is the name of the city where the, uh, where the British are keeping the artillery. So there's a world where he betrays the Germans, there's a world where he doesn't, and everything in between. And that's what's so interesting. Upon my reading of this story, it's not that Borges is telling us this is what happened, but rather Borges is telling us this could have happened. In the words of Borges himself, the Garden of Forking Paths is a detective story, and the reader is the detective. If you guys enjoyed this video, don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe, and I'll see you in the next one.